I like Disney properties, but I don't follow it like you do. I'm a, I'm a Lucasfilm guy primarily. What do you think this does internally at Disney? Do you think they're beginning to have conversations or do you think they just shrug it off? I think they've got their heads in the sand. Um, Disney does not like to acknowledge that there is a problem. They don't like to acknowledge when they F up. Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to my channel. I'm Lorena, Lorena Creole, and welcome to another episode of An Audience with the Queen, where I bring in someone from out there in the interwebs or orbit out there in uh, this world of pop culture, and we just kind of sit back and have a conversation. So you guys get to know them a little bit better. I get to know them a little bit better, and we just have fun practicing that uh lost art of conversation if <laughs> a better term so with me i have lauren from that park place how are you my dear doing good how are you Nah, i'm doing i'm doing well i'm doing well trying not to let the sun kill me here in florida <laughs> good luck uh yeah it's interesting. You have the tourists that'll come down here and they're just like, oh, it's great. We don't need sunscreen. Uh, yeah, you do. Yeah, <laughs> I, you do. I was, I was down there for the first time last year in April and it was uh, gorgeous weather. It was still mild enough that I got by with it, but uh, had a lot of fun. It's beautiful country down there. Oh, good. Good. I had a good time before we, uh, let's see, before we get completely inundated by tourists and... The uh, snowbirds, I'm going to say, are just starting to trickle in from other parts of the other parts of the U.S. So, uh, what part of Florida did you visit, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, we were down there to uh, to be around Universal, so around the Orlando area. And, uh, oh, uh, okay. A, uh, I was there for about a week and had a really good time. Even got to go to Gatorland, and uh, uh, it was it was a kick. <laughs> That's my park. I love Gatorland. <laughs> Yeah, it was a blast. <laughs> That's a real Florida. That's why I tell people go, go there, go to their Gatorland. So I'm so glad. It seems like every time I drive by, it's got a full parking lot. I'm like, yes, everybody go go to that park. Oh well, I guess I start off by asking you a couple a uh, couple questions. First of all, there's so many that park place has so many things going on um, with it. So first of all, how did you get involved with that park place? It's kind of a, a weird story. Um, I had been following Pro kind of just through various posts that he was making in various places. I think originally the WDW forums. Uh, and I had really followed um, some of his leaks around uh, The Last Jedi and, and discovered mm. that this guy really seemed to know what he was talking about. But he wasn't staying at any place consistently. He eventually uh, popped up with uh, Pirates and Princesses, and I was following him there. And then uh, he kind of vanished again. And then eventually I tracked him down to that park place. And I'd been reading his stuff. And I, I thought that he had some really fascinating insights into things. And then he wrote a, a review of The Mandalorian. And he went on kind of a rant about the uh, uh, not removing the helmet rule. And he was sort of mocking the Mandalorian religion. And he said, what kind of religion is this anyway? And so I wrote a comment that was about article sized and, and rebutted him <laughs> and i never really thought that he would see it but mm -hmm. a couple of days later he sent me a message uh, uh through email and said this is a really interesting comment would you like to write an article about it and so i said sure i can do that and uh, uh we did that it did pretty well and and he said uh would you like to write some more and uh, he said it'd be kind of on a trial basis and we'll see kind of how it goes. And I was having fun doing it. So uh, I wrote a bunch. And before you know it, he started standing up YouTube channels and other stuff. And that's kind of how it all came about. 
Oh, very good. Yeah, I like hearing cool, cool stories like that. Yeah, with uh, with uh, with Pro, it's like I remember his posts on the WW forums, and I'm like, oh, okay, this this guy knows a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was it was pretty obvious because you could see uh, there were some posts that he put up on Reddit. There were there were various places where he was popping up. And all of the other people that were talking about what they had uncovered, a lot of them were sourcing their stuff from him. And that's kind of what made him a fascinating individual. I, I really wanted to know, how's this guy getting this stuff? And I never dreamed I'd actually ever have any real interaction with him. It just sort of was serendipitous. So um, it's been a kick ever since. Yeah, yeah, same here. I'm just like, the person who I, I really started to follow his posts with the whole rise of the resistance debacle that was going on. I'm like, he knows a lot of uh, a lot of information. So I just got a kick out of finally getting a chance to meet him through Valiant and others. I'm like, you're that guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I remember when we were all during the lockdowns, uh, I remember I first came across Valiant uh, through Midnight's Edge uh, when we were Working from home, I would stream Midnight's Edge in the background for hours at a time because they had a lot of long form content with a lot of great guests. And so I kind of knew all of these guys vicariously through watching them on the various channels. Um, it, it had no real thought of ever being on any YouTube channels or commenting or writing or anything. It was just, mm -hmm. it just sort of happened. So, yeah, that's kind of how it, uh, how it does. I got peer pressured into doing a <laughs> YouTube channel because uh, I was a little too, not well, not snarky in a bad way, but in the uh, in the comments, we're like, oh, you need to come on screen. I'm like, why? Who wants to see me? <laughs> well, that's kind of the fun thing. I, I think a lot of times people watch these kind of channels because they're looking for a voice. They don't necessarily look for somebody that they agree with all the time, but they like seeing different points of view. And a lot of times when you're dealing with, say, the professional outlets or people that are advertising something, they have a point of view that they're trying to push, but it's short and you don't get a rebuttal. So I think part of the reason mm. that, that um, the uh, personal influencers are taken off, you know, that this kind of indie journalism is because there's a genuineness to it. You know that when you're, you're seeing these people argue about these things online and these panels, the passion's real. And I think that's what people are looking for. So if if you're passionate about something, whether it's on my side or the complete opposite side of me, it's fun to watch the argument take place, especially if it's an argument that's made in good faith. And I think that you get more of that here than you get all the other places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of, I liken it kind of to uh, back in the day when you'd see, you know, the news person out there trying to figure out what happened and you know there's that one guy <laughs> that as soon as he gets as soon as they ask him he just goes off on a tangent and tells you exactly what what he's thinking to the point where you're just like yeah okay yeah I'm pretty much inclined to you know to believe that person and and, and I agree that's kind of like how this whole you know influencer I don't know if I call it influencer oh, well that's what they call it influencer sphere is people who, you know, who are, who are genuine, you know, about, about their opinions, whether they're, you know, right or they're wrong or, or whatever, whether you agree with them or not, but just that, you know, they're being their authentic self. Yep. Yeah, I agree. You know. Yeah, so I, I see a lot of this. <laughs> A lot of those people, especially my favorites are usually old ladies on YouTube. <laughs> well, um, yeah, it's, I think there's, I, I agree with you about the term influencer because there's sort of a negative connotation there. A lot of times you're thinking this is somebody who is uh, commenting on something because they've been given access. But I think it's easy for the audience to tell. There there are people that, that do this because they're into whatever their thing is. And mm -hmm. if you're doing it for passion, that shows in the work. Uh, and if you're just taking a party line and you're not you're never deviating from that, no matter the quality of the product, that also shows. Um, so I think that uh, what YouTube and, and other venues have given people is um, a place for some genuine commentary where you get to showcase honest, real people. And 
it's at a level that never has been before. And I think that's why traditional media is suffering so much is that there's the corporate packaged product and then there's real people who are talking about what's going on. And that's exciting. That's, that's something that, that never used to be able to happen. Yeah, it never did. Um, I remember, uh, I think it was Andrew Breitbart, I believe, where he was like, if you have a phone, you are a citizen journalist. You know, he's like, you can get out there and get a perspective that the mainstream media can't, you know, wouldn't be able to do. You give it unfiltered, you know, it's just you and you're genuine and you're, you know, and you're out there. And I'm like, wow, that's actually a really, you know, powerful, uh, powerful message, especially considering how technology has broken down that barrier. You no longer need like an agent. You don't need, you know, a super huge broadcast studio. Technology has made it to the point where it's just like all you need is, you know, your phone and an internet connection and boom, you're broadcasting to, uh, to, the, uh, to, the whole, uh, to the whole world. Interesting point. It's like when I'm out, like live streaming at the parks, all people will come up and ask me. They're like, "Oh, well, what's your channel?" Okay, yeah, we're just gonna watch you while you know. We're, I'm like, okay, while you're walking around the park, or if you know, I'm streaming, watching the fireworks. I'll have people jump in my comments, like, "Yeah, we're a couple of rows behind you of people." I'm like. Um, all I'm doing is it's just, you know, it's just on the fireworks, but it's things like that, that people, you know, like to like to see and they like to, you know, they like to be a part of. So, yeah, yeah. I, I part, part of the fun for me is, uh, I mean, I, I have a very small YouTube channel. It's, it's very tiny. Uh, I never really intended to start one, but Last year at a celebration when they were showing the trailer for uh, the Ahsoka series that was going to be airing later that year, they had um, the line where, where Ahsoka states the words, heir to the Empire, and it offended me, and I, I got upset about it because I could hmm. see this was not going to be heir to the Empire, and I, I decided I'm just going to read the first chapter of that book and put it up there for people to listen to so they could see how the actual heir to the empire began. I didn't know if mm -hmm. there would be any audience for this at all. And it's a relatively tiny audience, but a lot of people really wanted to hear that. And one of the things that surprised me is that there's a whole category of people who are interested in these things, but are not natural readers. They either they're not comfortable reading or maybe they don't have a very good reading skill, but they're perfectly mm -hmm. happy to listen to a book. And that was a real surprise to me. And so I, I never thought that I would be reading novels, uh, certainly not full books, but I'm, let's see, I guess I'm almost five in now. So uh, it's, it's working for me. <laughs> wow. Five chapters into uh, Air to the Empire? Oh, no. Five, no books. Five, five novels. Uh, I read the whole, uh, the whole oh, Thrawn gosh. trilogy. I'm now into the... Uh, uh, the the Hand of Thrawn duology and about to finish that series and then we'll see where we go. Wow. So you're like one of those people, like my <laughs> my friends are just like, oh, this novel came out. This, you know, Star Wars novel came out. I'm just like, yeah, just uh, just tell me what happened because I just, it's like, I, I love to read, but it's I was like, eh, but I got the movies. Why? Why do? Why do I want to? You know, the movies and the courts of a princess lay. I'm like, I'm done. I I really don't. You know, feel why I should have to. You know, read the books. But I work in IT, so I work with a bunch of nerds. So they're all reading books. Like they've got the books on. You know, on their desk and everything. So I borrowed a copy of uh, *Heir to the Empire* from one of my coworkers. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm actually going to sit down. I'm going to read this. I'm like, yeah, this is actually really, really cool, but uh, I don't have the attention span anymore <laughs> to read to read the books. But people around me were reading those books. So while I was mostly into the films, I was aware of the people who read the books. So some of the lore from the books kind of would trickle, you know, would trickle down um, to uh, to me. And what made it easy for me to get into the books when I did read them 
Like for example, Darth Plagueis audio book. I'm so busy, but I love listening to that. So I keep backing up parts of it and listening to it again. Is that if you've watched those six movies, doesn't matter which EU book it is, it lines up immediately. So even if you even if there are these characters that you've never heard of before, there's some common gateway character from the films that will get you uh that you get that will get you into that. So let me ask you what first of all, what got you into Star Wars in the first place? Well, the movies, when I was a kid, uh, I remember going to see Return of the Jedi in the theater. So I'm I'm old enough that they were still kind of in the theaters when I was just a little kid, but I was young. And so I enjoyed them. I thought they were good films, but I wasn't obsessed with them. I had some of the toys and mm -hmm. when it went away, it went away. Um, I don't remember exactly which event occurred first. I know that two things happened. Um, mm -hmm. one is that I was on a, a family vacation and, uh, we had gone to visit some friends of my family. We ended up in a mall and there was a, a software store there that we stopped off at and I had some pocket money and I ended up buying the game that I actually wanted while I was at the store. And then I happened to notice there was X-Wing in the bargain bin for $16 and I had enough money that I could pick that one up too. And my thought at the time, this is back in the days of floppies, was that I could pick it up and I'd probably try and trade or sell it to somebody else for something that I actually wanted. But when I got home, I decided, well, I'll give it a shot. I'll install it. And I prided myself on being a good gamer. And I sucked at this thing. I was awful at it. And it made me mad. And part of it was because at that time, I didn't have a joystick. I didn't have a throttle. I was trying to play with a keyboard and mouse. And that's just not a way to play a flight sim. So I ended, <laughs> up, buying a, I ended up buying a joystick. Uh, I got some tips from people who knew how, knew how to play. And before long, I started getting really good at it. But there was a story component to the game. And it dealt back mm. to the movies. And I didn't really remember the characters or what had happened. And so it led me back to watching the movies again and becoming familiar with them. Somewhere around this same time, I picked up Heir to the Empire as well. And same kind of problem. I didn't know who the characters were quite, and I wasn't really familiar with all the people. And so that all led back to the movies. And then as I got deeper and deeper into it, it just kind of snowballed from there. Okay. I love asking how people get into, you know, certain, uh, certain fandoms. I know for, for me, it's like I was watching Star Wars and kind of like the same thing for me Return of the Jedi was like the first one that I actually saw in the movies although well I'll back a little bit I was supposed to go see it in the movies and I wasn't able to see it the first weekend that you know that it came out but happened to be in the mall at the bookstore I'm like what do you mean Return of the Jedi the book the, the movie just just came out. I'm like, oh, you mean I can actually read this? I, I it spoiled me, but I didn't freaking care. <laughs> I just thought it was cool that I could just get the book, sit there, and just you know, and just read, and just read the uh, read the book. Then by the time I saw, you know, the film, I was like, well, okay, that part wasn't really <laughs> yeah in the book, but you know, okay. Or I remember this, you know, internal dialogue that was, uh, that was going on. So yeah, I love hearing how pe different people fall, you know, fall in love well, with Star Wars. Originally, I was kind of a, uh, more of a Trekkie. Uh, I was a big diehard fan of Star Trek The Next oh. Generation, because that came out right about the right time for me. But I think part of the reason that Star Wars bit for me permanently is because, first of all, the next generation ended. And I had been a fan of that show, really diehard. I read a bunch of the novels as well. But at some point, somebody mentioned to me that there was a dictum with the Star Trek novels that they couldn't have an impact of any kind on the universe as a whole. They just were completely self-contained and didn't have any bearing on the, the TV shows or the movies. And mm -hmm. when I realized that, it was disappointing. Star Wars was different. They treated their EU as though 
what happens in the books affects the books going forward. And oftentimes when the EU exploded, they would cherry pick out of the EU and bring it into the other properties. And so it was a kind of a virtuous cycle for all of their properties. And that really appealed to me because it meant even if I didn't like the story, mm -hmm. it mattered. And I felt at that time that, sure, there were some bad EU stories, but there were also some good ones. And so it felt to me that, yeah, I might get an occasional bad apple, but it was just as likely that I was going to get a good one on the next one. So that made it worth it to me to accept the bad stuff, even if I didn't like it, because an awful lot of the better stuff that might come later would sometimes retcon or skillfully take a plot point that didn't work so well in this book and turn it into something better down the line. And so in that way, I could accept the entire EU, even if it had a lot of stuff that was crap. <laughs> that's, that's, that's something Disney should learn from, but they haven't figured that out yet. You you would uh, you would think so. That, that's why I found it um, extremely funny that Kathleen Kennedy had said, "Oh well, we, we don't have any source material to work from." I'm like, well, excuse me. <laughs> I, I feel like th that's a quote that uh, I believe that she was saying that in a targeted way not really considering what her audience was because that was right after the last Jedi came out and it was starting to get ripped apart in the media. And um, th this was before people started trying to build it back up again. There were some mm -hmm. rumblings in Disney that they were concerned about the direction of the sequel trilogy coming out. And they started floating these rumors that Benioff and Weiss were going to do an old Republic trilogy. And they also said that Kevin Feige was potentially going to be doing a Star Wars story too. Mm -hmm. That threatened Kathleen Kennedy. And so I think her 800 page novels comments was about Benny Off and Weiss and Game of Thrones. And her comic book stories were about Kevin Feige. She was trying to take a pot shot at them, but the way it came out was that we don't have any source material. <laughs> and I, I think she just, she leveled a double barreled shotgun at her feet and pulled both triggers. <laughs> Both. Uh, I'm like, granted, I've only seen the six. Okay, well, eight. I, I refuse to watch Rise of Palpatine. I just, just, uh, just not. Um, and only a couple of books. But even I know there's a ton of EU novels that are that are out there and. Uh, that you can refer to. And even, I'm like, okay, Kathleen, even where you are in LA, it seems every freaking bookstore out there would have some note, at least it did at the Barnes and Noble and Encino, that's what I remember. They would have notes saying, this book would make a great screenplay. This book would make a great screenplay for this reason. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And I, and, I, and, I, and I agree with you. I do not think that she truly considered the audience that she was talking to when she dropped that. No, I. Uh, do you remember when they were announcing the sale and how the transition was going to take place and they announced that Kathleen was going to be taking over Lucasfilm? She was there at a table with George Lucas and an interviewer while they were talking about this. And George said right in the interview, I'm kind of transferring this treasure trove over so that it can be used. And the fact that they decided, no, we're just going to chuck all of that and do our own thing. I understand they don't want their creators to be hamstrung by this thousands of years of history. I get that. They can't incorporate everything. But it's a no-brainer to know that there are some stories that, that diehard fans consider the real sequels. You know, this is what they expected out of what we were going to get out of 7, 8, and 9. If you... I don't think they understand how much the casual audience actually follows the diehard audience to decide whether or not something is worth taking a chance on. And by discounting that and saying that, nah, that they're, they're not important. You really attack your own merchandising chain there. And that's, that's a, a dangerous game to play. Mm -hmm. And you're actually, you're 100% right because with Star Wars, it's like you always, it's all, it's it's like a trope, but it's true. It's like you have that one diehard Star Wars nerd 
Should I waste my time with this? No, 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 no. Or you got to see this. You got, you know, you got to see this because you have your diehard fan base. And then outside of that, you kind of have the, the normies who they, they like it. They're not deep into the fandom, but when a new film comes out, you know, they're like, yeah, I want to go and check it out. I want to go see it, you know, enjoy it, have a, you know, have a, have a good time. And I do not think that Disney realizes just how that fan base works because their other properties, they had nothing like that. It's like they bought that, like they bought Star Wars, they bought Marvel, but have no real idea about the fan base underneath that and, you know, how much people are invested in the characters and in all of the um, well, canon or uh, collateral that comes uh, that comes with that. Well, and I think I'm, that lack of understanding is causing problems. I'm really glad that you mentioned the characters because I, I think that's the thing that they don't seem to understand. They wanted to buy Star Wars and Marvel because they felt that they had the princess market locked down and they wanted to appeal to a male audience. That's what they said they wanted initially. And I'm not saying that you have to pander just to men or that, that women can't be Star Wars fans, but what they're doing instead is they're creating cardboard cutout characters that act as ciphers that don't really have any depth or personality. And so the audience... I think they're having trouble empathizing with these characters. I, I think they're also missing the fact that it's necessary for your character to have flaws because mm -hmm. that's part of what you're trying to overcome as a hero. It's not just that you're overcoming whatever the obstacle in the story is. It's also that you're overcoming whatever your personal flaw is to move beyond that, to grow past it so that you can be a better person. And if, you're, if your character has no flaws, if they have nothing to overcome, if they're already perfect, they're boring. You just, you can't empathize with a person like that. All you can do is sneer with contempt. Or feel that, you know, that you're, you know, that you're being preached to. It's just like, I can't, you know, I can't, I can't learn anything, you know, from the seemingly perfect character that gets everything handed to him, figures out the force, knows how to fly the Millennium Falcon. That one, <laughs> that one really irritated me. I'm like, you've got, no. I bypassed the compressor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is like, yeah, sure, sure you did. But yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It's like, I would say with, with Disney, part of it, not everything, but part of it is that Disney used to be cops at storytelling in general, like they knew how to write characters that would have you empathize with them, um, characters you cared about what happened, um, what happened to them, and people would see themselves in those stories. They had universal, you know, universal themes and universal appeal. And somewhere down the line, they stopped. They stopped doing that. Um, I. Don't know why. I guess maybe they got lazy or something like that. It's like they bought Pixar. Well, before they officially bought, you know, Pixar, Pixar films and their characters were being recognized more than the Disney characters. So then they bought that, and you see what happened with uh with what happened with uh with Pixar. And I yeah. just I, I oh, feel like okay. a, I feel like a lot of it is. They they became so successful. They they had such massive properties that were bringing in a billion dollars a flick, and were critically acclaimed. I think they really did start to buy into the idea that we could put out anything, and people are just going to come. And mm -hmm. that's when I think they started deciding that we can start pushing an agenda if we have one, because first of all, we think it's a virtuous thing to do. We think we're making society better, and secondly they're going to come because they're a, 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 a pixie duster. You know, they're, they're somebody that is Disney for life. And th that's the mistake I think they made with Star Wars from my side of things is that I used to be one of those guys. You'd be amazed if you saw all the stuff that I have on my bookshelf, <laughs> but uh, not anymore. <laughs>
You know, that, that's uh, the acolyte is the first time that I have decided there's no way I'm watching this thing. You, you've told me you don't want me. I believe you. <laughs> so that's a good point to bring up to, to bring up the acolyte. So before, so before the acolyte, were you watching the Disney Plus um, Star Wars shows? And if so, what was your opinion of them as a whole? Well, I, I was a big fan of The Mandalorian. I really did like The Mandalorian. I thought season one and two were excellent. I was completely puzzled by The Book of Boba Fett. There were things that I liked about The Book of Boba Fett, but I felt like it definitely felt to me like something happened in production. And it felt to me like, to me, it felt like interference took place. I don't mm -hmm. know if it did, but it, it felt very much like a, there's too many cooks in the kitchen here and there's some really weird editing. And, and so I, I kind of felt like something's wrong here. Obi-Wan, I was excited for because everybody wanted an Obi-Wan show. That was, that was mm -hmm. really an opportunity for them to uh, gain back a lot of the goodwill that they had squandered. And again, there were some very small portions of Obi-Wan that I liked, but most of it felt like this is a high school production, and I feel like you're insulting me a little bit. Then we got to uh, The Mandalorian Season 3, which, again, felt like I, I don't even believe this was really John running this. And that's when we started mm -hmm. hearing that Dave Filoni's position within the company had changed. And it felt to me more like there's a heavy Filoni influence here. And I'm not somebody who has been a diehard Filoni guy. I'm also not a guy that has trashed him completely. I've always felt like he's a 50-50 guy. There's some mm -hmm. stuff that he makes that I think is pretty good. There's some stuff that, that he makes that I think is just absolutely awful. On average, he's about average. But season three killed The Mandalorian for me. And that's when I really started to get angry. Then Ahsoka came out. And... Ahsoka made me beyond angry. It, it was at that point that I knew I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I cannot reward these people for what they're doing to this franchise. I don't believe in you anymore, and you're not going to guilt me into watching it because I used to love this thing. So that's when I checked out. Mm. Yeah, that's for for me, the Mandalorian was something that I was really interested in because I had no clue who the Mandalorian were. The trailer looks slick. I'm like, okay, this is cool. I can learn about, you know, who, you know, about the Mandalorian, who, you know, just what it is, what's his deal, and whatever journeys he's going on. So it's like, ah, uh, looks good. You know, I'll give it a chance. Season one, I liked. Season two started off kind of bumpy, but the ship got righted and eventually, you know, they somewhat stuck uh, the landing. Enough to say, okay, can't wait to see season three. Um, Book of Boba Fett, why? I, just, it, it was just a you go and you take one of the most iconic characters in Star Wars and you make up a back to tank addict pretty much for, for the most part. I'm like, seriously, this is this is what you're going to do to Boba Fett. Turn him into a small town mayor. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm like, if you're going to be a gangster, be a gangster. Go up against the huts. Let's actually see the seedy underbelly of Tatooine. But this is Disney and they're not going to go there. So instead, you know, we get a cross between Fast and the Furious and the Power Rangers and spinning, shooting moves and... <laughs> It was, it was just, it, it was such a hot, it was such hot garbage. It, tr it truly was. So I'm like, okay, yeah, whatever. Let's get to Mandalorian season three. We'll be back on track, right? Uh, no, the wheels are falling off the bus. And I'm like, okay, well, I keep hearing about, well, I'll say quote unquote rumors. Oh, they're going to retcon the sequel trilogy. I'm like, well, as far as I can see, this train is still headed straight into the sequel trilogy. Nothing is changing. The season just fell up 
part Mandalorian, basically a guest on his own show. And it's just like, how could you go from an absolute banger of a first season and okay, but forgivable second season to this? And then you have Kenobi, which I thought, okay, this will be good. See the scenes that we didn't see in the movie, the scenes, you know, where he's supposed to be protecting Luke. So we'll kind of see a lot of that backstory that's going on. So I, I could, I could kind of, I could kind of see that. And even with the trailer, they had the music and then you see, you know, you see, you know, young Luke. I'm like, okay, maybe this will work out. Uh, no, no, no. They decided to basically make it the Leia show. And I'm just like, are you forgetting those of us who, you know, who have a lot invested in this fandom and you're just taking stuff and twisting it around because you have something to prove or some kind of experiment that you want to try. So that was Kenobi. Um, Ahsoka, uh, I liked Rosario Dawson. So I was a Rosario Dawson fan. I was pretty much agnostic about uh, about Ahsoka until I saw a lot of really stupid stuff going on, like cartwheels in space. And uh, but at least there was stuff that you know that I could that I could laugh at. And then you have the acolyte. There is nothing redeeming of any redeeming quality whatsoever that is that is in the accolade and it's it just more. solidifies my thought that they you know i mean i knew this but it's just like yeah they star wars fans lucas era star wars fans they do not disney does not like you it's been a weird experience for me because like i said this is the first time that i have specifically chosen not to watch a show and so i'm having to hear about it from people who have been watching it. And it's a very confusing experience. Based on what they've told me, mm -hmm. I've made a number of predictions. I don't know if they're going to come true or not. I I hope not, but uh, I can see where they could possibly be taking this. But I guess in a weird way, so far what I've heard doesn't sound quite as bad as I was afraid it was going to be, but it still sounds bad enough. <laughs> I don't think it's it's something that's probably recoverable. Can you explain it to me in such a way that it would make sense? I can try. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I did see that you gave the last episode a zero out of ten stars, so I, I yes. I'm guessing that it's it's not going well from your perspective. Um, no, no, it isn't. Uh, again, as someone who's just watched the six films, I call that a baseline level of canon. You have to line up with that. If you do not, I will tune out. The Acolyte, how, how can I put this? So, okay. So apparently there's like these twins who somehow were able to be born through the, the force or something like that. And one is going around killing Jedi. I mean, pour one out for Carrie Ann Moss. Apparently, you can get stabbed by a lightsaber and survive, but you get a knife to the chest. Guess what? You're, you're dead. I don't. I, that makes zero zero sense. Uh, you've got kung fu fighting. You know, crouching tiger, hidden Jedi going on, which we've never, you know, never seen before, and. Apparently the oh God, what's the heck was her name? Uh, one of the twins, I guess May. She's in a vendetta out, you know, killing Jedi. And her sister Osha, who washed out of Jedi training, they suspect her of, uh, you know, of these uh, of these Jedi murders. And the last thing we see is that all of a sudden May sees her sister, and they yeah they came they came face to face. And uh, with a lot of uh, exposition, a lot of telling and not showing, which is kind of like, okay, why are we seeing this? Why is this moving this way? And uh, yeah, if I remember correctly, one was, uh, no, 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 no. They weren't aware of each, each other. Each one thought the other one was dead. 
And then they happen to like see each other. The end of the second episode, we're kind of like, this is kind of quick of uh, to have this happen. But the third episode, the one with the coven of witches and not the witches from Macbeth. Okay. We've got like Dollar Tree witches that are, that are going on here. That these two twins are basically conceived through, oh, not, not the force because they, the force is for power. Okay, power over someone. The witches call it a thread that they use to keep everyone together. Okay. Whatever the heck that is. So <laughs> apparently, so, so, so apparently you've got these two twins that are born to two lesbian witches. Um one who I guess was the incubator, and the other one who knows where the heck what she did i don't know but apparently it's taboo what she uh what she did which is very very much like with darth Plagueis. yeah so that's what i was going to ask is that I, I have heard some rumors again i don't know if they're true but i have a suspicion of where this is going i do want to know since you're listening to darth Plagueis, how is that meshing in your mind are you are you catching anything there or um it's been a while since i've since i've listened to it so this has made me want to go back and listen to it but from what i remember of reading it and then watching this i'm just like this this shouldn't be happening at least not I mean, what like things like 50 50 years or something like that, 50 to 100 years or something like that. And like, what, why is, why are they going back and doing this? And then I look and it's, it's like they're trying to take that Sith property, Sith prophecy, deconstruct it and basically retcon it. Yeah. My, my sense of things is there's two things going on. I, I think Part of it's going to be a stolen valor case. I think they're going to change the nature of Anakin's birth. I think that's one of the things they want mm -hmm. to do. The, the other thing is, um, I suspect, related to the nature of the Force as you've described it, but I think they're going to make a more permanent and lasting change. And I'm curious to see if that part comes to pass. I think there were lots of seeds that were laid in Ahsoka that are going to that are going to be related to what's going on in this show. Mm -hmm. That is, that is my impression. Um, granted with this third episode, I have zero interest in, uh, in watching. So are you going to continue to watch or are you going to drop it? You know, I haven't made, I have not made up my mind yet. Part of me kind of just wants to pop smoke and leave and then there's another part of me that needs to see how this train wreck ends and to actually witness what they do. Because what I believe is that, and again, this is Disney that we're talking about, I do believe that they're going to do something extremely permanent to quote unquote fix their sequel trilogy. Well, I, I've been saying that I think it was very deliberate that George came out and said the week before they dropped this show that he was the only one that understood the force. I think that was a swipe. And I think he's reminding mm -hmm. people. It's like, yeah, these guys don't have it. <laughs> no. No, they, they don't have it. There's no no coherent storytelling that's, that's, uh, that's going on. They give us characters that, well, I'll take that back. The one character that I do care about is Master Soul. And of course, that's played, played by uh, Jay Jung Lee. And you actually feel bad for him, honestly. It's like, I really feel bad that uh, that he said he's in this because he's, he's, he's a very good actor. But you can tell the material is garbage. Yeah. Absolutely I, I, garbage. That's the one consistent thing that I've heard is praise for the show is that apparently he's really owning this role. And it, it's weird hearing people describe this show because I'm in the weird place now where there's a part of me that is morbidly curious, <laughs> but I just, I know that it's like, 
Yoda saying in Revenge of the Sith, if you view the recording you do, then then only sorrow will you find. It's like there's there's no point to doing this. I I, I think I dodged a bullet, but I am curious. Um for 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 me and what I had to explain to some people is that when the whole explosion happened with uh Oh my gosh, with The Last Jedi. I didn't watch The Last Jedi in theaters. I, I, I missed that. Life happened, stuff happened. So I saw Solo when it came out and walked out like, well, that that's not what I expected to see. I'm like, is this, I'm like, eh, maybe it's maybe it's a one-off, you know? Yeah, they're allowed to have, have one. The Force Awakens, eh, it was all right. You know, Rogue One, I fell asleep on that. I've never seen that film all the way through. It's too boring. So I'm like, okay, I'll go home, rent The Last Jedi, see what this is about. I've never seen a Star Wars movie make me so mad before in my life. So I was like a year behind with uh, with that. And I didn't want to look at anything Star Wars for like a year because I could not believe the character assassination that I just saw. And I'm thinking any moment now, any moment now, Luke is going to come to his senses and he will become the reluctant hero. I said, that's what I thought I was going to see. And it didn't happen. I spent the better part of the next three years waiting for the rise of Skywalker having an internal argument with myself. I was trying to convince myself that it's not that bad. There's no way they're gambling with this. They have to have a plan. And I kept telling myself, I just haven't figured it out yet. I know they've got an ace up their sleeve. And then the first trailer for The Rise of Skywalker came out and I heard Palpatine's laugh and it's like, oh no. <laughs> I, I watched that movie once because I could not, I could not see the conclusion. And I, I vowed I will never watch that movie again. It's 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 a real toss up for me. Which one is worse? You can tell what pre the precipitating event was. That's definitely the Last Jedi. Mm -hmm. But man, they're both just awful. I call that one weekend at Bernie's. Y'all <laughs> dragged up, you know, Palpatine. I'm like, that's the plot line you're going with. Is uh is that I I just said I, I yeah I, I cannot bring myself to watch that yeah, <laughs> I don't know if I ever will no you shouldn't it, it's it, it's insulting in a whole different way than the last Jedi was I've read the the Colin Trevorrow script and I feel like that script was far superior to the Rise of Skywalker, it still wouldn't have been great. I don't think there's really, mm -hmm. there was no way to salvage things after The Last Jedi. But the fact that they went with J.J. again after the fact kind of boggles my mind. I don't know what they were thinking. I don't know who owed him what favor or, or whatever, but I was just like, there's no way I'm going to watch, you know, Rise of Skywalker friggin' space ponies on <laughs> on, yep. on ships i'm like i don't know what you guys are smoking but it's not the good stuff with you know, with this up uh, with this thing so yeah so with uh so with the acolyte i'm like okay i it's like i have to witness what is going to happen with this because for, for the majority of star wars fans because the majority of the star wars fan base is like about 70 percent male it is what it is i don't know why disney refuses to acknowledge this fact um but obviously it's biting them in the ass now because they keep ignoring it and they keep saying oh we're gonna make all we need to do is make female characters and women will come and see it uh no no we were happy with the way that the way that it is it, it's when I used to go to football games, when football was actually fun, you know, to go and watch, it's like I would go watch the games because I was genuinely interested, you know, in the actual, you know, games. I wasn't just, you know, there 
just to spectate or there to pick up people or, you know, I actually was interested in that. And that's, you're going to have that, per, you know, that, that percentage there. But with, with this, they're trying to say, when I say they, I mean the likes of the Mary Sue, yes, I'm looking at you, saying that the reason that the audience scores are so low is because it's being review bombed by men who can't handle women in uh, women in Star Wars and a, a non-white lead in Star Wars. And the fact of the matter is the show sucks. Yeah. The show absolutely sucks. And it's just like, I, I will fall on that grenade to tell people, yeah, I watched it and it sucks. Well, I, I mean, I think one of the stupidest things about this argument is that a key component of these kind of movies, these throwbacks to the pulps, is romance. It's like you've got Thank to have you. a, you've got to have a romance in there. You want a swashbuckling hero and you want a, a strong female who is not afraid to, I mean, think of Marion and Indiana Jones, you know, when they first meet up again, she socks him across the jaw. <laughs> it's like, you want that. You want sparks. And the idea that we don't want that in these kind of movies, it's ridiculous. You don't get that, that adventure pulp feeling without it. And I think it comes back to one of the things George understood. Balance is actually important here. You want to have a yin and a yang, and you want to have people that are not necessarily diametrically opposed, but definitely have their own viewpoints that they're they're arguing about. And mm -hmm. I think making this argument that we don't like women or we don't like minorities is ridiculous. I thought the best chemistry in The Force Awakens was between Finn and Poe. I would have watched a whole trilogy of those guys because <laughs> they, they genuinely seem to be having fun in The Force Awakens. But, mm -hmm. you know, nothing doing. It's uh, it's just a mess, and you know Disney really has their own self, you know, to blame. They wind up giving the likes of like Leslie Headland, which really she does not have a very thick resume at all. This multi million dollar IP, and this is this is the result. So if this thing does completely bomb. Because you're you're an overall Disney watcher. I'm primarily I I like Disney properties, but I don't follow it like you do. I'm a I'm a Lucasfilm guy primarily. What do you think this does internally at Disney? Do you think they're beginning to have conversations, or do you think they just shrug it off? I think they've got their heads in the sand. Um, Disney does not like to acknowledge that there is a problem. They don't like to acknowledge when they F up. Um, you, you will never see <laughs> a Mia Culpa from, uh, from Disney, case in point. Um, state of Florida, Ron DeSantis, right. won his lawsuit against Disney Company. You haven't heard squat out of the Disney Company um, about, you know, about, uh, about any of that. Um, another way of looking at it is, of course, Epic Universe is really coming together and Disney has nothing to counter it. They asked Bob Iger about it. Oh, we're not worried about Epic Universe. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You are very, very worried about that. And Universal has former Imagineers working for them. And the difference is night and day between Galaxy's Edge, which you can't tell what the heck that is when you walk in there. It's like, I don't know, is it a mall or a dive bar or what the heck is going on? And then you walk into the Wizarding World of Harry Potter and you immediately know where you are, what's going on. You feel like you are literally, it's, you're so immersed that when you step out into the rest of the park, it's almost like cognitive dissonance. When you're out there, you're just like, okay, um, all right, I guess I have to go back into the semi real world now. But when you're in there, it's literally, it, you feel like you're in, you know, you're in, a, you're in the films. So I think with Disney, they're gonna keep their heads in the sand until financially it really starts to hurt. 
And sure. right now they've got people, you know, they've got like the likes of uh, Black Rock and the rest of them, you know. Right. One of them. At some point, though, I mean, however it happens, Bob Iger will not run the company forever. There's going to come a point at which somebody else comes mm-hmm. in. It does look to me like Disney is going to slip to number two when it comes to the theme parks and possibly already has. Do you think that they will ever be able to recapture the magic? Do you think that they will be able to go through some kind of a revival? Or will they always be a tarnished brand from here on out? The only way that they can is if they get someone from outside the bubble, either from outside the bubble or someone, it's very unlikely, but someone who's come up through the ranks, like say through the parks, you know, like that. Not 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 Josh Namaro, he's pretty much a talking head or whatever, but someone who's, you know, who's done those jobs who's, you know, run attractions, who's had to deal with customers, you know, with guests in uh, in the parks. It's very possible, but it has to be someone outside of that Disney bubble because they're all huffing the same stuff. <laughs> they're all up in the pixie dust and they can't see what's going on. And they need, like this is the reason why Nelson Peltz was so attractive because he was a disruptor. They need someone who's a disruptor that can go in there and they basically say, you know what, this is what you used to do. This is what you used to be known for. You're not even holding yourselves up to your own standards. So until that happens, they're not going to be able to recapture it because they don't even respect their own legacy. It's It's hard to me that it, it looks like they're having trouble maintaining even what they've got. And that's startling to me. And that's that's why I think you're absolutely right about Epic Universe. Because if you can't even keep what you've got running, and these guys are putting out brand new attractions that everybody seems to, to be excited about. But it goes back to the question again, I think. if I mean, first of all, do you think Nelson's going to make another play? Do you think he's going to come back again? Mm, never say never. Okay. Secondly, it might not. Uh, it might not be. And and I kind of say that because uh, it may not be him. It may be, maybe his proxy. I mean, I know he sold all of the shares and everything, um, but you never, you never know. So, say you do get that disruptor that comes in that wants to rebuild the legacy. I I don't know how closely you follow the the personalities. Do you have a person? in mind that you would want to be head of parks? Do you, is, is there somebody that you think would be a good person to slot in there? Not from a, not from Disney. And definitely not, definitely not Elon. Well, go blue sky. <laughs> see, see, you could get anyone. Do you, is there anybody that you would slot into the role if you were in charge? Oh man, not right now off of, off of the top of a, uh, off the top of my head with regards to uh with regards to CEOs because that's a very that's a very small club and I'm not quite familiar with uh not quite familiar with the with the CEO ranks I was I was just curious yeah. you know because because I, I know you love the parks. You're there all the time. And so mm-hmm. I just wondered if you had a particular designer that you happen to like or that you think is uh, might have the chops to create what I remember from when I was a kid. I mean, I, I haven't been to the parks a lot, but I mm-hmm. always love Disneyland. Even to this day, I the last time I was in Disneyland was 2014. And I think that was probably a good time to be there because it was before, before they started charging for everything like it's dlc <laughs> um yes but i've always had a soft spot for it and uh i remember it that way i i still think of it as like when i was a kid it's just a fun place to be yeah i i it's a, I, yeah it's like i i it's like i love it um five generations of my family have have been through there so i love going to the park seeing people have fun seeing those pop culture icons become, you know, realistic and, uh, and to just, you know, to just, in, just enjoy, enjoy those things. Um, like it, it's, I almost want to say they would have to poach someone from Universal, literally. They would, uh, 
they would have to do that because you have to have someone who understands the creative side as well as the technology, um, the technology side. And that's, and that's what Walt used to respect. That's what Eisner used to respect back in the, back in the Disney Renaissance days of let Imagineering do what Imagineering is best at. And now you basically have people pushing merchandise, for example, with Tiana's Bayou Adventure, okay? The ride can't stay up and operate in a steady state, but they've got a crap ton of merchandise ready to sell, you know? Then can't think, uh, can't think, can't, uh, can't think like that. Not when at Universal, all you do is buy one wand. As soon as you sink that $80 in, it doesn't matter how many of those wand stations they put in, you can still use that. I think that's a good point. That's actually smart. So what, I don't know if you've ever answered this before. You probably have. What is your favorite Disney attraction? What is the, what is the ride or the experience that for you is the one that is the one that makes you smile the most? Hmm. That's a very, 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 very good one. Um, you know what? I'm going to say the Haunted Mansion. All right. That I, I was a I, I, was a, I was a Pirates of the Caribbean guy. That that's this is why it's so hard. It's so hard to choose because it's like there's Pirates of the Caribbean, and then there's um, the Haunted Mansion, of course, and then Splash Mountain. When you know when they when they had Splash Mountain, um, but I think for me the reason that I liked Haunted Mansion so much is because I used to be scared to death of it when I was younger. And then when I got older, I'd tease the younger siblings about being scared to, you know, to, to ride the attraction. And now when I go, probably because I like horror movies so much, you know, I go in there and I look at all of like the details and how they put it together and why it looks the way that it does and sounds the way that it does and all the effects, you know, that it that it does. I even have a book written by Imagineering how they put all those effects together in uh in the Haunted Mansion. That is that is like my favorite, my favorite one. And I just I just I just love it. It's it's got so many sight gags. Um it just when it I, just is it's so cool. When I was there in 2014, I was taking my son, who was three at the time, and I took him into the haunted mansion, and that was a mistake because he reacted the same way that you did. When they when you go into the lobby and the lights cut off, he jumped into my arms and almost knocked me over and was shaking the whole time. And it was one of those things where I felt really bad about it as a parent at the time because we had to go through the whole ride and he was terrified. And I was I was scared because I'm trying to hold him while he's shaking and you're surrounded by people in the dark room and I'm worried if I trip, this is going to be a bad situation. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would like to take it back, you know, if it wasn't so expensive now, if I felt like I could actually get value for the money, I'd love to take him back to see what he thinks about it now. Yeah, that's that's the one thing with just like the nickel and diming and it's without the value. That's the thing. It's like you can charge what you want, but if people perceive that there's value to it, they will pay it. But when you remove that value, they're not they're not going to uh they're not going to pay it um anymore, which which is a shame because it used to be when you went to the parks yeah, it was a you paid the Disney premium, but it was worth it. You could get the value out of it. And now you can't because they've just priced the average family uh, out. Yeah, it felt like a place that, yeah, it was expensive, but the, it was accessible to the middle class. And now it feels like that's that's kind of a hard sell. You're asking an awful lot for people to sacrifice to go there to what used to be kind of a rite of passage. Yeah, it, it is. And you'll even, and now, even where there's people who can afford to pay the price point, like myself, we won't do certain things. Purposely, everything is scaled down. We're just like, no, we're not, we're not staying at the expense of resort, staying at the value resort. We might as well stay there. Hey, this is great. We have everything, you know, that we need here, not spending as much um, in the parks, you know, at, uh, at all. 
um, just being very, very judicious. Like your, you know, your wallet's kind of like shut, as opposed to say at Universal, which is kind of like shut up and take my money. <laughs> Yeah, Even as like a Marvel collector, you go over there. It's like no, don't 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 step in don't step in the in the stores. No, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I, I think that uh, that's the direction it seems to be going. I'm really curious to see how Epic Universe does when it opens up. I especially uh, the the one land. It's their. Uh, I don't remember what they're calling it, but it's the Universal Monsters. I really want to see what they do with Dark this. Universe. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That, that to me looks like an awful lot of fun. It looks so, it looks so good. It looks so, just so creepy. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is like fascinating. I mean, that's what made Universal too, is that it's like, that's their stable of characters. And that's the value of knowing the value of the IP that you have. When you recognize what you have and you play to those strengths, people sense it. That's what Disney is failing to do. They have all these IPs and they're treating them like we can do whatever we want with them. It doesn't matter what mm -hmm. people want or what they remember that it used to be. Uh, it's just wild to me. Yeah, and then in case case in point, I I started my live stream um, on Monday from inside this little restaurant called Pinocchio Village House, and it looks like something straight out of Pinocchio. You expect to see Geppetto come walking through, with like how all the tables and the chairs are carved, and there's the art that's on the walls, and the it looks like a little German village pretty much when you go in there. And as opposed to now, there's places that you know looks like a Starbucks. All of that theming is gone. All of that difference is, um, you know, is uh, is gone. But I, I think Disney is headed for a very, very hard, uh, very hard lesson. That's why when I hear people who are just like, you know what, I'm I'm done with Star Wars when it comes to Disney. I said, yeah. I, I said, yeah. Don't feel bad because that's on Disney. It's hard though. That's you know, these, completely. These these are the things you grow up with and you love. It's hard to let them go because it's a touchstone. It's something that, that is meaningful. Yeah, in one sense, I recognize I'm a 46-year-old guy who's got a room full of toys that are all Star Wars. I recognize this is silly and a little juvenile and there's a bit of embarrassment there. But it's also something that makes me happy. And so, you know, exactly. you, you, you got to hold on to those things. Exactly. Exactly. Ugh. But yeah, it will be interesting to see how this uh, how this ends. I believe it's going to end in a big, huge gasoline fueled explosion <laughs> to the acolyte. Oh well, Lauren, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so 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 very much. Um, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at Lauren Connor 9030 on YouTube, uh, or you can find me at Lauren Connor on X or Twitter, whichever you prefer. And uh, I occasionally write art articles for that park place, and you see me on his streams quite frequently. So uh, look for me there. All right, folks. Well, I have links to those in the description box of this video. So please do go on over and subscribe to uh, subscribe to Lauren. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel. And of course, we will see you next time. Bye.